And we're live. Hello and welcome. My name is Rira and I work for Roman's Bookstore. Thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual event with Leanne Dolan, who is here to present her newest novel, The Sweeney Sisters. Joining her in conversation is three-time Rita Award-winning author, Susan Wiggs. We are so grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this uncertain time. Uh, before I properly introduce our guests, I have some announcements and some housekeeping rules. Romans will be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website at romansbookstore.com, as well as our social media platforms. Our next event is slated for May 6th at 6 p.m. for the presentation of East of East, The Making of Greater El Monte. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. We will be doing a Q&A towards the end of the conversation. So if you would like to submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button on the question and it will bring it up to the top of the list. We will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And um, please consider supporting our bookstore by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, The Sweeney Sisters. Just click on the green, but green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. And we are selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those interested. And with that out of the way, let me introduce our guest speakers for tonight. Liam Dolan is a writer, speaker, and author of two Los Angeles Times best-selling novels, Helen of Pasadena and Elizabeth the First Wife. She's a regular humor columnist for Pasadena Magazine and has previously written monthly columns for O, the Oprah Magazine, and Working Mother Magazine. She's also the producer and host of Satellite Sisters, the award-winning talk show where she created, which she created with her four real sisters. Our interviewer tonight is Susan Wiggs, who is an international best-selling author with over 40 romance and historical novels, including her acclaimed Lakeshore Chronicle series and her latest release, The Oysterville Sewing Circle. She's been featured in the national media, including NPR's Talk of the Nation and USA Today, and is a popular speaker locally and nationally. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Leanne and Susan. Uh, please excuse us if there are any awkward pauses. It's all part of the virtual experience. Uh, sit back, <laughs> relax, and enjoy the talk, everyone. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for being here. And oh, my gosh, thank you, Rira, for coordinating this. Uh, I think that teaching... They figured it out. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. Um, first of all, huge, huge congratulations to Leon. It, it's... I, I can't overemphasize what a big deal it is the day your book comes out it's it's a it's a book birthday you know our our, our um, friends and family it never gets routine and it never gets old and um, good for you for um, soldiering on I'm sure a lot of your plans for this book launch have changed because of what's going on and thank you for keeping your chin up. Thank you for writing this amazing, amazing book. You guys, I, you guys order the book now, like yesterday. <laughs> it's so good. It's so, so good. Um, anyway, congratulations to that. Um, I'll just tell you Thank briefly. You. That you're welcome. Um, Thank I, you. You're very welcome. I, I was introduced to Leanne through our mutual editor. We have the same editor at William Morrow Books. And um, she put us together because we have this very, um, really smart editor who knows how to put things together. And she sort of saw um, that, you know, this is an author that I would fall in love with. And I did, I really did. I was so thrilled to get an advanced reading copy of Leanne's book. And um, I remember it was, it was a cold, awful weekend or something like that. And it was one of those books where when I got to the end of it, I turned all the way back to the beginning and I thought, oh. I will do this again. No, seriously, really. So <laughs> huge congratulations. Thank you. The good things are going to happen. So first things first, what are you wearing and what are you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Susan, I went out. This dress from Trina Turk popped what? up on my Instagram. 
Instagram okay. well, and you have the same taste, the color, the pattern. Can you stand matches up? Matches the book. Girl? Yeah, matches. The, it's just yeah. It's so what? it's a short blue dress. Oh my god! It's, it's got so a cute. really. It's got a really cute bottom. And, oh my god! Um, cute. And so I'm sorry that you can't see that, but oh, I am wearing real shoes bad. as well. Well, I will and not. I bought it in January. Oh, okay. I bought it in January. It popped up on my Instagram, and I'm like, that matches my book cover. It's perfect for the book no. tour. I went right over and bought it. Just walked right into the store. I was like, I'll take it. Let's just try it on. I knew it would work. And um, and so when you said my plans have changed, yes. But you know what? I'm wearing this dress, Susan. Good I'm wearing it. Um, Where yeah, I'm getting my money for it. Good for you. And well, I, you. Look like a million bucks. And what are we drinking? Thank you. I'm just having a touch of Prosecco for celebration. Because oh, I, you know. Yes, okay. a little and bit I'm, of bubbles. I'm having not more than a touch of <laughs> log of <oil. laughs> It coats my nerves with happiness. It's my pandemic <laughs> elixir. <laughs> so, okay. Well, let let us get on with our little chat. Um, just uh, uh, just the tiniest snapshot for people who aren't familiar with the storyline. Um, Leanne has done something that we all aspire to do as writers, which is to um, find that nugget that intrigues everybody universally in just a few words. And, you know, some people call it the, the, the movie pitch or whatever, but it is a new sister is found through a DNA test. And we're going right. to avoid spoilers, but we can talk about the dynamics of families and sisters and the dynamics in your personal family. Is it four or five, three sisters that you have? So I have four sisters. Uh, well, I think yeah. all of them are are joining us tonight. Yay. And I, okay. I have three brothers. I have three mm -hmm. brothers as well. So we are eight kids in our family. I'm oh the youngest. Uh, so I'm number eight of eight. And um, what? Uh, right? Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. No wonder you're a writer. <laughs> you have a lot of material there. <laughs> so much and. When I sold this book, um, I said to my sisters, everything bad we've ever done is going in the book, but I'm changing all the names oh, that's and great. rearranging the birth order. So don't worry, no one's going to know. But um, <laughs> the book is about three sisters from Connecticut where we grew up. Uh, so three, not five. And they're really not us because they're a different generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're fictional characters. It's it's much more fun to make up characters yeah. than it is to try to recreate yeah. people yeah. especially your actual sisters i mean i would never live that down so um so it's about three sisters they have some prominent parents and then thanks to a dna test the makeup of their family changes and that's a story literally i see every day on facebook you know people introducing hello here's our new brother or, hello you know wow. we just met this person and i just thought that was a really interesting jumping off point for a story about sisterhood and family dynamics. And, and have you, have you pursued that? Have you done the, the 23 and me or the ancestry um, spit in a tube test? Oh. <laughs> no, our sister Liz did it. And, and then we figured, well, that's fine. You know, like, she, yeah, <laughs> like, Were there any it's sort of like, Oh, okay. Were there any and, surprises? And, no, I mean, it was just so vague. It was like, yeah, you're, you're Irish mm -hmm. and you're English and you're German. And, um, you know, when you're the youngest of eight, the last yeah. thing I suspect is that I have a different dad. <laughs> 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 I mean, my late mother was very tired. Uh, that's all yeah. I have to say. Like, yeah. Too tired to fight him off. <laughs> yeah, I meaning like I don't think she was looking for any outside action, Susan. So, uh, so that was in her game plan. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I love so, your no, background I, and I love the inspiration for your story. And and you're right; it 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 makes your imagination take flight to imagine what would happen if somebody walked into your settled adult life that you weren't expecting in in this dramatic fashion it's amazing and and wonderful and unexpected and and i i loved it well i had um someone posted on our satellite sisters facebook page about this happening to them so 
you know, I did the old thumbs up, like, ooh, thumbs up. And then I thought, is it really though? Like, what would that be like? And it literally changes everything you think about your family, your birth order, your this, your that. And I also know for sure that people would have really different reactions within the family. And um, and so I did some back back behind the scenes messaging with this person who didn't want to be named, but she said, yeah, not everyone was super thrilled and stuff comes out and, and it's a real surprise. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it's not a smooth transition into, yeah, this is honky dory. It's just not. So, uh, I thought, Whoa, that's good stuff. It is good. <laughs> because so. we can, yeah, for the readers, we look for conflict, not in our lives, but in our fiction, you know, the more conflicted a character can be, the better off we are as the writers. We didn't, but we try to avoid that in our real lives. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's, let me just segue because you've got, I, I love your your questions. Um, okay, great. You know, but you know what? Before we, you know what I want to do before that? Um, say a little bit more about the Satellite Sisters because they were new to me. I, I subscribed to them after I read your book. But um, just say uh, probably a lot of the people um, on this chat are, are familiar with it. But in case they're not, just um, give us a quick um, overview of, of that and how did that happen? And how cool is that? Um, so Satellite Sisters is essentially a talk show that I've been doing with my four real sisters for 20 years. We just celebrated our 20th wow. anniversary. Way to so go. On April Cheers. I thank you. I know, right? I know. Mm -hmm. We're still celebrating Thanksgiving together, um, wow. which was always our, our goal. But um, it was my sister Liz who was in marketing that, you know, 20 about 25 years ago said, I don't really understand why there's nothing on the radio that sounds like my friends or my sisters when we're talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. Why is it all men yelling about politics and sports? And we were like, we don't know, Liz, why don't you go figure that out? And cause that's the kind of gal she is. She did. And we ended up pitching satellite sisters, a show about the things women care about. Um, first to, uh, to public radio to WNYC in New York. And we were on mm -hmm. public radio for three years and then mm -hmm. we moved to ABC Radio uh, for another six years. And the deal, Susan, was that um, we're, you know, five real sisters, but same mm -hmm. parents, different lives. Uh, we were living all over the world at the time. We'd never all lived in the same place. So the show has taken place in New York and Bangkok and Portland and Los Angeles and then Moscow and Los Angeles and Portland and Dallas. And as people move, we're able to do the show together. And then about 10 years ago, Disney sold off the radio division. So I took my iMac into the Apple store and I was like, could, could you show me how to do a podcast? I think I want to do that. So the, the little genius there um, showed me how to do a podcast. And then we just started Satellite Sisters as a podcast 10 years ago. So we've really been going 20 years and um, the show is about, you know, we talk about our lives and we talk about mm -hmm. the news and we talk about things that, you know, connect with people. And uh, hopefully <laughs> that's our goal. That's our goal anyway. Um, but, you know, I want to, the show, the podcast has really sort of served to be an interesting focus group for my writing because you really figure out what people care about. Sometimes it's the headline news is important. That's great. Mm -hmm. Um but they really, really care about other stuff like, you know, breaking up with their hairdresser or what are they going to make for the Thanksgiving side dish when they can't cook? Yes. Or, you know, um, yes. you know, they have a kid who who can't do their community service and won't graduate from high school. How are they supposed to handle that? So um, it's been an incredibly wonderful community and podcasting is um I think a great medium for women because there's no gatekeepers. You know, when we were on um, mm -hmm. public radio or commercial radio, there's all kinds of people telling us what was important and we, women know what they think is important. And that's mm -hmm. what we can talk about on satellite sisters, but we have great satellite misters too. We have great satellite misters too. Oh, well, thank you for that um, introduction. If you guys haven't checked out satellite sisters, now it's a podcast, right? 
on pretty much yeah. any podcast platform. I think I yes. have Stitcher and Google, but um, it's so easy to log on and it feels like you're in a room full of friends. And so I'm, you know, kudos to you and your amazing sisters. I have just one sister. She's my best friend in the world, but you know what, like you and your sister, she's in, um, you're gonna have to Google this, Barunga in the Northern Territory of Australia teaching in an Aboriginal community. Wow. <laughs> I know. And right now she's so locked down that they have actually closed the roads going into her town. And oh. so, yes. And she has been reading like a boss. She's a teacher, but they've stopped. So she's been reading a book a day. And I can't wait. I for smell pot. I smell podcasts, Susan. I'm just <laughs> yes, I know. I know. It's it's I amazing. Yeah, her husband can't come see her, even for a conjugal visit. <laughs> it's oh. like, because he has to, if they try to come in, then they have to be on lock, you know, quarantine for 14 days, going in and going out. And so, yeah, she's definitely, it's, it's uh, my sister and her books and her um, hot yoga class that's on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, well tell no. us, uh, also tell us quickly, speaking of that, how does your typical day go? Um Right now, you know, while we're all staying home, I hope we're all staying home and, and staying right. safe. Right. What's the um, typical day for Liam? Yeah, I wish I could say, oh, I, I'm super focused and I'm more productive than I've ever been, but I'm not. That's not true. Mm -hmm. no. uh, I'm pretty distracted. The oh, only God. good thing for me, and I'm sure it's true for you, is that I'm used to working at home. I've been working at home for the bulk of the last 20 years, um, you know, all of the time for the last 10 years. So um, that that's not a freak out for me. I've learned to like not go to the refrigerator at 930, 1030, 1130, 1230, 1230, Like I'm through that. Um, so I have been getting up, um, you know, doing Satellite Sisters. I tend to cart compartmentalize my work because mm -hmm. producing and doing the podcast is really, really different than writing fiction. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and, and then the magazine columns is a whole nother kind of work that I do. And those are different heads. So, uh, you know, I work on satellite sisters Monday and Tuesday. Those are our production days. And then we record on Tuesday and then we'll do anything we need to do for the podcast. Those t essentially those two days. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the time, then I focus on the writing piece. So uh, for the last three or four weeks, I've actually had a couple of magazine pieces I've had to do. And it was a struggle to really, <laughs> it's a struggle to focus and to not get obsessed with Twitter. And, uh, you know, I'm enjoying watching the governor's uh, news conference every day at noon. That's like an anchor for me. Um, but I've learned to really turn off the news and kind of get to work. Um, and then I'm doing a lot of, um, I do a lot of dance and yoga like your sister, but I'm doing zoom dance classes and zoom yoga and walking my dog, which is really helping. So mm -hmm. uh, all those things, but it's, I don't, I certainly don't feel as productive as I've been in the past. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to honor that as they say, <laughs> but I know mm -hmm. I gotta get, get in gear. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. Okay. Well, let's get to a couple of our, our questions. Um, I love the articulate um, and, and really sharp questions. So we'll just go with, with the ones with the most votes. Um, this one, um, you have such rich sister experiences to draw from. Where and how do you draw a line between what's personal and what's fiction? And I would add to that, how do you not get in trouble with your meanest sister? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, none of my sisters are mean. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, one of the really fun things I've learned, you know, fiction, you, you've written fiction your whole career, Susan, but fiction mm. is new for me. I only started mm. 10 years ago. I did, mm. you know, other things before magazine and nonfiction and essays and stuff, but fiction's new for me. And one of the things I've come to really appreciate about fiction is you can make stuff up. Like that mm. is the best, <laughs> that is the best part. Yes. So, you know, the character development for me is my most favorite part of writing, sitting down and like, Mm -hmm. doing those character breakdowns and, and, uh, you know, figuring out who they are and you can make them be anything or do anything like 
that's the fun part of fiction. Um, so there's no part of me that ever thought, well, I, I want to take, you know, my sister Monica and I want, mm -hmm. but I just need her to be X, Y, and Z. No, I, I didn't even, I don't even think like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I have a lot of experience being a professional sister. So what I wanted to get right. You're in professional was, sister, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> what I wanted to get right was the dynamics of sisterhood, yes. which is in our case, not always best friends or not at each other's throat. We're not always fighting and yelling. We're from an Irish Catholic family. So, you know, suppress and deny is kind of our motto and how we roll with things. You know, we all have our own lives. We have our own friends. We go on vacation separately, but then we'll come together. Like, you know, we have a dynamic that's kind of give and take. And, and one of the great things about working with your sisters is you, you don't get stuck in childhood patterns. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times families get stuck in like, what was your worst moment when you were 13? Okay, that's that's how we're going to deal with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, like they just keep bringing it up and you can't ever break free. But when you work with your sisters as adults, you figure out, oh my gosh, they really have attained some skills. They really know what they're doing. You know, they're, they're funny or they're charming or they're smart or they're good writers or they're hard workers. So... Um, so I tried to think of the dynamics of sisterhood that I wanted to portray, but then the characters, um, they're just their own, their own people and the characters. So of, the, of the four sisters in the book, um, which one came to you first or did they come as this undifferentiated blob and then you assigned different traits to each one what was the what was that or do you even remember because for the readers this is i'm probably talking about something that came to her what a couple of years ago at least two years ago uh, yeah you know i i remember this development because it was really fast it was mm -hmm. uh i had a completed novel and then our mutual editor wanted to hear any ideas i had on sisterhood and and my agent called me and said in an hour <laughs> no <laughs> so um I bet you okay. do your best work on the fly like that. Ah, so, <laughs> so they kind of came to me all at once. Like I can't, I can't differentiate. Um, but you know, just the idea, it's more like the idea of this, the, the oldest sister having a lot of the responsibility, caring for the mm -hmm. parents being, you know, the, the like high expectations, right. the middle sister, like to the beat of her own drum. And mm -hmm. as a youngest sibling i really wanted to create a younger sister that was um well not me because she's a competitive runner and tall mm -hmm. and skinny mm -hmm. so, that's not me well, that's not, totally none of those things are me that's totally you <laughs> how do you think she fits ah. in that dress <laughs> so, um, but uh but you know a younger sister that sort of had had enough confidence to kind of tell her older sisters what to do so, mm -hmm. um, but I don't, yeah, th so they all came to me in a bunch. They came to me in a bunch because it was about creating a dynamic that would serve mm -hmm. the story. In a herd, <laughs> a herd yeah. of sisters. Yeah. <laughs> sisters needs a collective noun. Maybe somebody will come up with one for us. <laughs> okay. All right, so here's another question from, from your readers. Um, yeah. How do you keep, well, actually, you kind of answered that, but maybe you could add a couple of hints. How do you keep from getting distracted while you're writing? And I think you gave us some really smart um, strategies just now. But maybe, I mean, is there a, do you have a, a routine that you go through? Go into that a little well, Yeah, nobody's perfect. But, um, you know, for me, it is. I find fiction exhausting. So, I mean, I write a lot of words every week. Don't you wish uh, it burned more calories? I know. I mean, I sometimes <laughs> I have to go lie down after a writing session <laughs> in the afternoon. I don't know what it is. It just takes up so many brain cells. Mm -hmm. So I, I have learned really, um, one of the things I do um, is when I wake up before I get out of bed, I actually envision the scenes in my mind that I have to write that day. It's like a little mini movie that plays in my head. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like 
I, I'm gaining momentum. And then when the kids were younger, it meant like, then get them off to school and walk the dog and then sit down and sort of capitalize on that. Mm -hmm. um, now, now the kids are gone. So it's just me eating two breakfasts and then walking the dog <laughs> and capitalizing on it. Um, but uh, so I, and it, it, again, it's this idea, like, these are the hours I write fiction and nothing else gets through. I'm not going to answer your email. I'm not going to post on Instagram. I'm really, really going to try not to go to Twitter though. That's hard. And, mm -hmm. um, so I, I find that writing time pretty sacred and I don't need a ton of time. I mean, I, I hear about writers that write like 12, 14 hours a day or write all night. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Not, I just not got girl writers, only male. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. So I'm good from like nine to two. And then again, then, as I said, sometimes I lie down because I'm exhausted, but, um, but that's it. And one of the tricks I use, um, you know, when you're writing a scene that you just don't want to write, you you know, it's going to be a troublesome scene. At least for me, yeah. I have scenes like, oh, how am I going? Oh, this is yeah. a tough one. I know it's complicated. What I'll do is I'll go back and do a touch of rewriting from the day before, like just going over the pages and the words. It's almost like I can trick myself and just, oh, now chapter 11. Okay, here we go. And I, I find that that kind of works. So, um, and then I don't, yeah, I don't try to, those are my writing hours and I don't worry about it after that. I, but, but I find when I'm in the middle of writing a book, it's all I think about, you know, mm -hmm. for the rest of the time, even if I'm making dinner or walking the dog. Oh, sorry about Marcus. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of dogs. So. Oh, God. Yeah. What kind of dog do you have? An I Irish have pattern. German Shepherd, German Shepherd. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for that. You know what I was really hoping for is that you give me the secret, but <laughs> clearly you're keeping it to yourself. Yeah. Um, oh, I love this. Have you talked to Reese about a movie opportunity? <laughs> love this. Yeah. Talk to me about any possible nibbles that you've had. You know, I think because of the general current, uh, my agent actually said, she called me today because it's my pub day and she said, okay, now it's time to go out. So um, we have not talked to anyone specific. Although mm -hmm. because the book is about three redheaded sisters, we are <laughs> definitely looking at redheaded actresses. So, um, and my dream casting, and I never, my other books, I had no dream casting. I don't think this way. It's not my, I just... Oh. I don't write that way. I don't envision them like actresses, mm -hmm. but um, I, I feel like the the um, the Rooney sisters are really the key. Uh, Ooh, Kate and or funny. the Mara sisters. I'm sorry, yeah. the Mara sisters. Kate and Rooney Mara. Uh, they're actual sisters. One's the redhead. You know, there's an opportunity. So, uh, so we'll see. I mean, you know nothing's happening production wise in Los Angeles. Um, no. but so, so we'll see, but I think, yeah, I, I would be curious to see what would happen to these Sweeney sisters. Oh God. I know. I know. We yeah. often as writers, we get things optioned, but rarely does anything actually come of that. It's just, there's right. some interest and we get all excited and then we go buy earrings with the option. <laughs> 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 I know. I, know. Well, I don't know who's getting those good. million dollar options, Susan. Do you? <laughs> no. But you know what? Your your characters were so well wrought. They were so vivid to me that um I'm hopeful that you know the right person will, you know, will hook into that and really kind of come up with the right idea for some sort of um production or something. What about Sweeney Sisters the musical? You have Sweeney Todd, Sweeney Sisters. Oh, wow. That's big thinking. That's some big thinking. Yeah. I'm going to get Sondheim. I'm going to get Sondheim on that. There you go. There you go. Okay. Another question. Um, oh, this is a this is a common question um, from writers and readers. How long did it take you from start to finish to write this book? And how does it compare with your other two previous books? And I would say, uh, just for clarification, um, we often as writers have ideas that percolate for months or years sometimes. And so it's not from the idea to the finished book, but I guess 
they, they're more curious about when did you sit down and write, you know, chapter one. And this was a that? particularly, this was a fast book for me, the fastest I had written. So I had mm -hmm. two previous novels published. And then I had a book that took like four years to put together because of life and other things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that sold. And then I, I pitched this book, um, at the same time that the uh, finished novel sold and, mm -hmm. uh, Rachel, our editor liked this pitch. So it was kind of a surprise when she said, we want to bring out the sister's book first. I, I thought, well, that's inconvenient because I haven't written it yet. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I bought it up last week. And now, so this was a very fast book for me. And mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, it was like a great tonic. The other one had sort of taken too long. And mm -hmm. I was kind of freaked out, like, I don't know, maybe I don't know how to write fiction. And so for this one, it was a seven month deadline. And uh, I found out at the end of July, you know, 2018 and August one, I just sat down and worked and um, I turned it in. I asked for an extra month. Uh, it was a six month deadline. I turned it in in seven and then there was like three or four months of rewriting. So, but it was fast for me and that was a really great exercise. It felt like a, an exorcism, mm -hmm. <laughs> felt like an exorcism because the previous one had just taken so long and i was like oh i'm never gonna finish it but this one just not that it was easy but i was able to focus and mm -hmm. uh work through it so well one then, thing that is always um like a, a very fraught moment for the writer is when we start talking about the title and the cover art of the book uh nine times out of ten for me I don't keep my original title on the book. And um, I do have um, cover approval for my books, but I have no taste and I'm really bad at visual design. And so I'm not super helpful in that regard, but a, a great cover can um, really um, draw the readers into the right book. Or, and, you know, the wrong cover can create a really a, a problematic um, sales piece. So, um, tell me what you thought about that process and and for the readers it's usually you've turned the book in your editor has read it some other people at the publisher have probably read it and they say okay it's time to start um you know designing this book and it's it's kind of a big deal so describe that a little bit yeah i did not have cover approval um so uh, Wait, and but i and okay. the other thing I also know about myself is I don't consider myself very visual mm -hmm. either. I respect the work that art directors do. Mm -hmm. I can look at something and go, I like A more than B, but I don't look at something and conceptualize a cover. I just, that's not me. Right. Um, and so I respect people that do that. So mm -hmm. the first cover, uh, the first series of covers came in and right away I was drawn to one. The book is set in Connecticut. It definitely is it's set in a super preppy town. Um, sailing is a theme in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was, for the record, a terrible sailor. And um, so <laughs> very not talented. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was a really charming cover with three sailboats and, and a shoreline. And it was blue and white. And I thought, that's great. And that's great. And it sounds we very settled cool. up. nice to me, another writer from Connecticut that I love. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it was really, it was charming. I thought it was great. And then apparently then the sales force said, well, we really like this book and we really don't love this cover. So then my editor, our mutual editor said, well, there's mm -hmm. an artist I'd like to try. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know any of this. Um, I went off on my one vacation last summer to a place that has like no Wi-Fi and I was doing a digital detox. And in the middle, I was getting frantic texts like, please, please look at this cover. Please look at this cover. And so when the cover came through, uh, I was I just had tears in my eyes. I'm like, this is such a beautiful book. Oh, my gosh. And so I love it. I, I love the it my eye immediately. Yeah. They shelved the previous cover. They mm -hmm. they said, is there anything, anything you would do? And again, I couldn't have conceptualized this, but the mm -hmm. heads were sort of disembodied. 
And I said, could you anchor the heads? Because it looks like I decapitated my <laughs> sisters. <laughs> and so then they gave them shoulders and like stuck. So, but other than that, I just was super duper happy. Uh, was, with, that your, with was that cover. your original title for the book or did you have a different title? I, that was the, I gave two original titles. One was the Sweeney sisters and the other was the sudden sister. And the I sister. thought they would like the sudden sister, but they, they, uh, you know, uh, they really like the Sweeney sisters right away. Oh, okay. Which, I like them both. They're awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So. And I do, I love the cover. It's, it's unique and yet I can look at it and kind of get a feel for the, the tone of the book. And so it's definitely doing its job. And our, our editor, Rachel, has a real knack for that. She's got really good taste. And so we're very lucky to have somebody to make our books look like something that somebody would actually want to read. Yes. <laughs> no, that's their job. I mean, they've mm -hmm. done a great job. Well, that's good. Okay, let me see if let, let's look at another question. Okay. Um, oh, I, this is I, I like this. Um, it says I used to live in Southport. I see you're from Pasadena. And so how did you end up picking Southport for the um, for your setting for the book? Oh, good. That's a good question. My mm -hmm. first two books were set in Pasadena, um, okay. Helen of Pasadena and Elizabeth, the first wife. And um, because I just thought Pasadena was a great setting for fiction, I was surprised mm -hmm. it hadn't been used before. You know, it's a place that has it's a big enough population. Mm -hmm. It's it's ethnically diverse, but there's this very traditional core at the center uh, that mm -hmm. sort of seems to run the joint sometimes and then there's new money and old money and there was a lot happening and i really enjoyed writing about pasadena so the first two published and that third novel i mentioned that <laughs> is off in the ether uh that is also set in pasadena so when i started to do this story i felt like i needed some new territory because i didn't want to keep mining the same old stuff so some of it was pragmatic but this is a book sort of about long kept family secrets. And, mm -hmm. you know, I Southport is this like the world's most charming town in Connecticut. I mean, it looks like a picture postcard. It was mm -hmm. uh, it's a harbor. It's right on Long Island Sound. It was uh, the number one onion producing uh, port in the country pre-Revolutionary War. Uh, it was burnt to the ground by the British, except three or four different um, houses and th that were occupied by Tories and then built up in the late 17th, early 18th century. So it's like, it hurts you. It's so charming. You know, it just, it makes your teeth hurt. And uh, there's a high level of maintenance there. But um, having grown up there, it was a great place to grow up. We had a lot of freedom. It was 45 minutes outside of New York. We could take the train in and out. Um, great beaches and everything. But over the decades, I've had friends that I grew up with, like, tell me these unbelievable secrets about their family. Like, wait, your dad was doing what? Or, or something was happening with your mom? Like, these are these picture perfect houses with their big brass door knockers. And I was like, that was happening behind the scenes. And um, so uh, I have to click something off my screen here. So, so I thought, well, that's a good setting for family secrets. And um, so that's how I settled on Southport. And then when I was growing up, Connecticut doesn't have a lot of movie stars. I mean, we had Paul Newman, he's the best. So we had him, we earned him, it was great. Uh, so, but, um, but we had a lot of writers uh, in Connecticut and growing up in the 70s, 80s, and writers were like rock stars and really sexy then. And um, one of the big writers who lived in town, he, he lived in Greens Farms technically, but we used to walk his dog in Southport was Robert, Lud Robert Ludlum. And so, um, and I, you would see him walking all over town and he always wore like black socks and sandals. It was very, very <laughs> provocative. No I way. I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm scattered. So yeah. For the readers out there, he's like such an iconic, um, well, uh, the late Robert Ludlum. Yes. Um, thriller writer. I yeah. believe he's a franchise now. I think oh, uh, the gosh, public yeah. Robert I mean, Ludlum books. 
He had like eight bestsellers on the New York Times list at a oh, time. Yeah. Like at the time, he was, a, you know, the Born series and everything. Yeah. So, um, so I just, when I started to put together this story about family secrets and the father in the book is a literary lion, and I thought, well, okay, I think Southport is actually the right setting for this because it would be a town mm. where people just wouldn't discuss things. There was so much that wouldn't wouldn't be discussed, you know? <laughs> of course, everyone was proper because, but as I've learned, not everyone was. Not everyone mm. was, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for that. That I, I appreciate that insight. And um, I'm not familiar with that, but now it makes me kind of want to go there. See? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a charming town. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's go back to the four sisters. How did you keep track of writing the different voices of each sister? How did you differ oh. between the voices between the characters? Well, here's a little trade secret. Um <laughs> So, something I've been doing for quite a while. Um, you know, at Satellite Sisters, we've had a book come out and we wrote a column, longtime column for O Magazine on etiquette. Mm -hmm. It was like the five of us answering questions. Um, and there's plenty of stuff for the um, radio show. And essentially, I've been the editor in chief of all the Satellite Sisters writing projects. And very often, sometimes with the O column, I would just write all the different sister voices <laughs> because mm -hmm. we were on the radio six days a week and we'd be answering questions like, okay, if you spill red wine on your friend's white couch, what do you do? And I, I would sort of email and survey and then put the answers in all five sisters' voices. Mm -hmm. So writing in different sisters' voices is something we've literally been doing for 20 years. So that was pretty, pretty easy for me. Not, I would like to say this because I know my sisters are on the line. They all have their own voice and they're all excellent mm -hmm. writers and they have plenty to say. But it was just mainly a way of managing the material that went out the door. So well, it was um, very impressive in the novel. I always knew which sister's point of view, you know, was. was oh, thanks. I was reading. So that was really well done. Um, Leon, how much yes. of the Tweeny sisters was outlined before you started writing? And was the process similar to your previous books, Helen and Elizabeth? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been an outliner since fifth grade. You know, once they taught me outlining, I was like, I love it. And um, I'm always going to do this. And I always have. I mean, I literally write like topic sentence one, A, B, C, D. I'm yeah. really an outliner. Every paper I ever wrote in high school and college, I outlined. So um, you even wrote that. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know how people just sit down and start writing. I don't know what that is. How do you do that? Who's got the time, <laughs> I don't Susan? Do that. I don't know. I don't do Who that. has the time? No, I don't have time for that. Yeah. So, um, Male writers. So with the, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, with the Sweeney sisters, I had to you know, originally submit like a two page idea and mm -hmm. then like a five pager and then a 20 pager um, mm -hmm. before the book sold. And if, if you're writing 20 pages, you're essentially writing a book. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, know, you have to outline all the characters, you're doing yeah. a scene, you're doing dialogue, you have to have a beginning, a middle and an end. So mm -hmm. I would say when I started the book, about 80 percent was outlined. But mm -hmm. then the other 20% is, is, is happy accidents and, you know, necessity and taking mm -hmm. a detour, you know, somewhere along the way and mm -hmm. characters emerge that um, you think maybe we'll have one scene and then you're like, oh, I like this character. I'm going to, I need to keep him around. That happened with the character Tim um, was just supposed to be a, a one scene guy. And he stuck around the whole book. And uh, oh, favorite, yeah. yeah. I know, I loved him, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, that's good. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the process. You know, that's letting stuff marinate and not being uh, uh, under. That, that's what I've learned, you know, now that mm -hmm. this is a fourth novel I've written. Yeah, you need to let that happen. Yeah. Well, it looks like we've only got a couple of minutes left. So okay. I want to give you, uh, well, first of all, I want to tell everybody here and Romans, thank you. Thank you for being yeah. here. Uh, thank you, Romans, for hosting us. Thank you for being readers and knowing that 
Um, you're never alone when you're reading a book. And so if you don't have um, the Sweeney sisters yet, please, please, you know, may, put it next on your list. I'd, I'd loved it. You're going to love it. Um, if you have anything that's even close to a sister in your life, this is what to get her for her next birthday. <laughs> and the final question is what's next from Leanne? What are you working on? What have you just turned into our very overworked editor? <laughs> I know I uh, two different ideas. So she has two different ideas in front of her. Um, one is a, a, a book based on a, st a story a friend of mine told me. Um, and it's set in Rome and uh, it's kind of a, it's about a it's about a woman who had to go to Rome in her 20s and take care of some family business and then returns in her 50s when and it's based on a true story. I think Nancy may be listening. It's based on a true story. I've, of course, taken it and with her permission and turned it into a novel. Uh, but I thought there was something there about um, decades going past and rediscovering a previous life and sort of going back and giving yourself permission to enjoy your life a little bit after decades of hard work. So there's that. And then the other one is a dance really <laughs> is a dance related story. Um, listeners of satellite sisters and several of my dance troupe are online. Uh, I I'm part of a, like a middle-aged ladies dance troupe and um, we do ballroom. We do jazz. We do hip hop. We do Broadway. <laughs> and I, felt like there was a story in that. So um, that's another idea that I've pitched. And oh again, my God, we are, we're on the edge of our seat. Okay, well, we'll definitely have to keep in touch about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Susan, this was, I can't thank you enough for doing this. What a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you. No, the pleasure was mine. Thank you so much. You, you're like the, the first human people that I've talked to all day. <laughs> <laughs> This is nose. Yeah. Thank you again. All right. Thank you so much to uh, Leanne and Susan uh, for being a part of our Romans Live series. Uh, and thank you to all of you who are watching from home. Thank you for giving up your time uh, this right. evening. Uh, you guys are the lifeline yeah. of independent bookstores everywhere, and we greatly appreciate your support and time. Again, please consider uh, purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, The Sweeney Sisters. You can do so by clicking on the green button below. And we are fulfilling online orders remotely. So if you would like to view our catalog, please visit our website at romansbookstore.com. We are also accepting donations as well as providing gift card options. And again, if you'd like to re receive regular updates on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on Crowdcast. And thank you again to everyone. And uh, we're gonna end the broad broadcast. Thank sure. you. Over and evening, everyone. What a fun night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.